we went to a very transparent pricing model that was kind of, this is your team retainer. Here's the raw cost of your team. Here is a fixed amount for our overhead. And here is a 20% markup on your people. That's the price. If you want it to be cheaper, we can put more junior people on it. If you have more budget and want to go aggressive, we can put more senior people on it. That's your call. And in all honesty, it almost eliminated price negotiation with our clients. What's up, agency owners? Jason Swank here with another episode of the Smart Agency Masterclass, a podcast for the agency owner that wants to scale and grow their agency faster and hear stories and struggles and pain and challenges from other agencies of how they got through it because you're not alone. That's the biggest thing of doing this podcast. And on today's episode, I'm going to talk with an agency owner that has gone in the past couple of years from a smaller agency to an eight-figure agency. And uh, and we're gonna talk about a lot of the things they did right, a lot of things that they wish they could do over again. So let's go ahead and jump in the show. Hey, Graham, welcome to the show. Jason, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on as well. So tell us who you are and what does your agency do? My name is Graham Barlow. I've been a tech entrepreneur for 25 years now. I built and sold a number of tech startups prior to this, but for the last seven years, been building a company called Iversoft, and we build custom software for companies and brands all over the world. Specialization in mobile, but do the whole gambit of kind of backend web development. The one thing we don't do is a lot of the kind of branded presentational work. We work with creative agencies and organizations everywhere to complement the kind of engineering backend. So... Um, there's a lot of people that run agencies, <laughs> right? That yep. they think the grass is greener on the other side, right? They go, <laughs> I hate agency life. I hate my life. I want to develop Facebook or Meta or Shopify. And right, you're actually yep. doing the both, like, or doing the reverse. So <laughs> either you have dyslexia yep. or you've been wanting to be, you know, right? Tell people yep. why you got into this, all joking aside. Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. I I come from a background of having built products and built games and seen the pain, suffering, and excitement of being on that side of it. And then also saw the opportunity as a service provider to partner with up and coming exciting ideas and opportunities to build the cool tools. And when appropriate, like just before joining Iversoft, I spent about three years in venture capital investing in a lot of early stage companies. And this was kind of the best of both worlds where we got an opportunity to see companies at the ground floor, work with them uh, when they are startups to scale up, but also get exposed to some of the coolest cutting edge technology with big brands over the world. Like we've done incredible R&D work in the 5G space. We are pioneering a ton of augmented reality technology. And from a kind of tech nerd perspective, it's kind of the coolest space to live in with all of the trials and tribulations of working in unknown and unpredictable technologies, which all of your agency owners will appreciate of when you expect it to do one thing and it doesn't. <laughs> exactly. Well, it just proves my point because I have so many agencies coming to me. They're like, oh, I want to get in the software space. I'm like, the grass is greener on the side that you freaking water. Like there's challenges yeah. on both sides. There's advantages on both sides. You just need to figure it out. And a lot of times I'm like, look, guys, you're this close. You're this close. Like why, why give up to go try to do something else that there's no guarantee when like, so cool. Let's talk about. When you joined as a partner for your agency, you were, I think, just a little over a million. Is that right? Or under it? We're under. So when I joined, I joined seven years ago. And the team prior to my joining was a team of six. And our services business, I think, was less than half a million dollars. We, like, we had booked lifetime revenue was less than half a half million. We were doing probably two to 300,000 in revenue. We have a small product side on the software business that was generating revenue, but we were really finding our feet on what software could do. But even with that small amount of kind of revenue, the company had worked with a number of incredible brands kind of pioneering in mobile because one of the co-founders, Vicky, who's our CTO, had done a lot of her co-op and kind of internship at Apple 
and got to stand up as one of the first people with experience on iOS when the App Store launched. And the company was based in Toronto at the time and got to be like, hey, this new app thing, I know how to do it. And that's kind of where Iversoft got its start. And we've kind of built on that ever since. What's really kind of changed from being an eight-figure to under a seven-figure? Like what's in your point? So much pain and suffering and expensive tuition. <laughs> I think when we started out, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but like when we started out, everything was these small fixed bid projects. We were going in, nothing was really complicated. We started on mobile before mobile apps were very heavy, right? So it was, it was like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a presentational app. It didn't have a backend. It didn't have a server. It didn't have anything. We knew the scope of work. And in a crunch, Vicky could do half the development in a weekend if we needed to. Fast forward a couple of years and we're in kind of multiple six-figure projects, up to seven-figure projects. And the complexity is order of magnitude higher. During my tenure here, we spent the first, I think, five years beating our head against the fixed bid wall in technology, trying to figure out the right way to make fixed bid in software work, where it's like someone wants an app or a website or a piece of software built, and you can go in and say, yeah, it's going to be $150,000. we are going to build it over this period of time. And do that in a way that it creates value for the client and ends up profitable. And I think when we look back on it, 70% of our projects or more lost money or like barely broke even. And a few of them were good, but usually good for unrelated reasons of like we, I don't know, under overscoped something or found a different tool that would help us go faster. And that was a very painful, grueling process to A B test of like, what can we change? How do we, how do we make that happen? But the reality is at least for us in software, is there's from start to finish, you learn so much about user interaction when people start using it. It's extremely hard to define every possible element of a software build up front. And especially when you're dealing in kind of emerging technology and Apple and Google are generous enough to completely refresh the platform every year, there's just so much to account for. So you either end up with crazy inflated prices that everyone kind of looks at and goes, that's insane, I can't commit that, or under scoping and then scrambling to try and be profitable on the delivery side. So a lot of pain, suffering, and learning as we we evolved past that. <laughs> so what did you have to change? So obviously you went from fixed bid to a retainer, but yeah. how did you make sure, like walk us a little bit more through that from the sales front to the marketing front to <laughs> even the delivery front, right? <laughs> It kind of happened by accident. I would love to say it was a stroke of genius across our whole leadership. You can team. say it's a like, stroke oh, of genius. We saw the light. Oh yeah, we're brilliant. Yeah, we no. woke up one day and we're like, "This is the way." I watched a video of you, Jason, and I owe say, everything to. I you. wish I'd watched a video from you, Jason, <laughs> earlier. It would have saved us so much pain. There you go. Um, there you go. That's all no, I we say. we. Right. We looked at some of our most successful accounts and the most successful ones were ones that were past the build stage in kind of the maintenance stage where we were working as the active tech team, supporting it, doing product enhancement, doing live support and DevOps. And those were the happiest clients. They were the teams on our side that were the happiest. And we started to look and like, why is that? And it's like, oh, well, like priorities are all aligned. We want the best product experience. We want the best customers. Is we're not racing to try and hit profitability on a six week or six month timeline. It's sustainable for both sides. And the clients are really happy because they're getting really good feedback from us. And nobody's kind of tracking every minute of every day for different reasons. And so once we started realizing that, we started building into our sales narrative of rather than kind of being very open with clients when they came to us. of like, here is all the reasons we don't think fixed bid works very well. And it kind of pits our team against your team because we're trying to make the cheapest, fastest thing fit in this budget. You're trying to get the best possible robust solution long-term. And we can all say we're all working for the best thing, but at the end of the day, we also don't want to lose money on every project. So there's like give and take there somewhere. Whereas on the retainer model, it's kind of, here's your tech team. We went with kind of a six, 12, 18 month model where it's like, here are the people you need. Everyone's pulling in the same direction. We're all going to give like very straightforward feedback on what features are good, what features aren't. If you, something pivots in your business, we're e it's easy to have the conversation of like, okay, we don't need a change request. We don't need to revamp your entire project schedule. It's a 
it's a living tech team where we're supporting you. And what we've seen is like, I mean, we made that change. And I think our development group went from a, like 20 to within three years, we're 50. It has been so much easier to sell, so much easier to maintain, um, so much easier to support talent on, and honestly, just improve client satisfaction across the board because everyone's aligned in the right direction. It's also changed the type of clients we're working with. We do we do work with a lot less on the small business side, and we're doing a lot more kind of medium to enterprise type work where they might have an established really strong web team or a really strong server team, and we're providing all of the iOS and Android engineering, or we're providing um, all the AR engineering. Like, depends on depends on the client and the project, but we're, we're coming in as kind of that specialized engineering partner for a long time to augment their, their team. Well, I like your approach because it was very similar to what worked for us when we were designing websites where I would explain to people, all these other agencies are going to design three to five concepts. There are going to be some on target, some way off. Like, why do you want to start with there? Or they're going to ask you, what websites do you like? which is basically saying, which websites are we going to rip off? And that's probably why your whole industry looks the same. We do it a little different. And then I would walk them through it kind of like how you did. Like, it's kind of like point out the issues that people are having, right? And then, yep. then say, this is how we do it different. So then all these other jokers that they talk to, they're going to compare them to you, which is yep. like, how are they not going to choose you? Yeah, one thing one thing that changed with it too that I think I mean selfishly I hope more agencies don't do this but I do think is <laughs> was beneficial overall is well, there's only two people that listen too. to the show anyway that don't That's good. I'll I'll take it. <laughs> no, so it, like because we moved to the retainer model instead of the fixed bid where everything's kind of behind a kind of brick wall or obfuscated within the pricing a little bit. We went to a very transparent pricing model that was kind of this is your team retainer. Here's the raw cost of your team. Here is a fixed amount for our overhead. And here is a 20% markup on your people. That's the price. If you want it to be cheaper, we can put more junior people on it. If you have more budget and want to go aggressive, we can put more senior people on it. That's your call. And in all honesty, it almost eliminated price negotiation with our clients because they see every dollar and know exactly what they're paying for and why they're paying for it. And it made the sales process a lot less stressful than when you, again, in the fixed bid world, kind of show up after two weeks of scoping and back and forth with a giant number, and then you're going every line item. Like, okay, why, why does sign up cost that? Why does analytics cost that? Why does, so it's been refreshing from that standpoint. The challenge has been that model doesn't really fit into the more traditional like RFP world or some procurement groups just don't have a way to make that fit. So I'd say that's the one thing we're still learning how to try and twist or contort ourselves into. So open to your advice on that. If yeah, you've well, heard. This is how we combated the RFP. And I always said like RFP stands for real effing problem request for punishment. There's two winners to every RFP. <laughs> the, the one that writes it, the first one out, like, like I have a, I hate RFP. I love it. So one of the things that worked for us is when we'd get one of those dreaded RFPs, We'd call them and say, look, anybody that can give you a scope of work that you're going to choose from this is not someone you're going to want. What I'd like to do is to sit down with you for an hour just to make sure we're right for you. And then from that hour, if we both determine we want to go on to the next phase, we'll do a half day workshop with you and really kind of plan it out a little bit more. Now, the half-day workshop is going to be a paid engagement. Now, we're not yeah. doing this to make money. We're only going to do this, you know, we'll do it at our cost. And we want to make sure you're serious, right? If you do it that way, like we did this with Lotus Cars, we did this with Hitachi, all those, then they would go back. Now, this doesn't work with government. Yeah. So, right? Sorry, government. You're a bunch of idiots anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I never wanted yeah. to work with government. Now there's some amazing people that work there, but the accounts that we would like pitch before we learned this, we're like, no, there's no way. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. What changed? Because obviously if these big companies are coming to you, what's making these big companies coming to you? So what changed in your marketing? Because, you know, I like the model that you have. And a lot of people listening are like, well, cool, I'd love to get these big companies and then I could charge more of the fees and that kind of stuff. 
And so that's yep. a challenge. What, what, how did your guys' marketing change? I would love to say we nailed it. All right, no, I'm going to take your advice. We crushed it, <laughs> and word of mouth referrals went through the roof. Um, I think that's one of the big things. Like we're we're still figuring out the marketing side of it. We genuinely, the bulk of our growth has come from word of mouth referral from existing clients, or yeah, our, our raw inbound really doesn't exist. I mean, it's part of why you and I got connected through Dan Martell's group because we're we are trying to crack the like outbound marketing branding thing. I will say like the thing that gave us a strong edge has been caliber and quality of talent that we've been able to attract. Our clients are seeing far above and beyond what they're able to attract and retain. And so that becomes kind of the sales pitch, both within their organizations and to other partners they they talk to and refer to us. is like, yeah. we can attract better engineering talent than they can, uh, especially for our clients that aren't necessarily technical. That's been our sweet spot is really leaning into the recruiting and HR funnel side of things. And but in terms of client growth, I mean, that's where I'm I'm here to learn because we have we have not nailed that. We've we've done great scale, but a lot of that is virtue of kind of taking on really complicated projects at at large organizations. And so we're we're trying to figure out the the secret to to getting to our from 10 to 20 million in in the growth. Well, here here here's the secret. There's no secret. <laughs> <laughs> right. Damn. So what I always tell everybody is I commend you for first off getting to where you're at on referrals. That's crazy. That's awesome. And it just shows to, and, and I also commend you for being honest too, of going, Hey, we still need to figure this out because there's a lot of agencies listening going, Oh no, eight figure agencies. They have it all figured out. I'm like, no, they don't. I wish. Like, there's, <laughs> there's, like even nine figure ones, they don't have it figured all out. 10 figures, right? Well, whatever it is. So it's always constantly a learning thing. Now, I always had a mastermind member always make fun of me because I had, my f phrase for a long time was referrals aren't scalable. And he goes, well, Jason, actually, I've grown my whole, and he's grown to over an eight-figure agency. He's an SEO agency. And he'd always oh, cool. go, well, I grew my business uh, referrals. And he had a system for it, not just... Like a lot of people going, I hope this person sends me business. He basically yeah. had it designed where, you know, he only did SEO for a certain niche. Anything outside that, he would refer out to other people and he would refer it out to three people, right? And then he would yep. keep count. Hey, I referred these guys five. They haven't sent me anything. Right. So I'll go yeah. on to the next. And so he yep. grew this because he was like, I'll pass you, you pass me. That was the only time I found the referrals. What I would think would work well for you is like, you probably know your audience, right? Like you, the bigger brands and it's outbound. And also here's a strategy that worked for one of our members as well. What they did. And I talked about this a little bit on our, um, if you guys go to agencymastery360.com slash attract, one of our members started taking all of their success stories and case stories and putting them mm -hmm. together. And what they did is they started running ads of the other clients, especially this would work really well with you. Ooh. So depending on if your brand would actually say who they were, like if you're working with Coca-Cola, you have we're, to be we're, We tend to be under so many layers of NDA, unfortunately, that we're like, in the plumbing that like we can say we're affiliated with, but going into what we've done is tough. But, yeah. but if you can find yeah. some, I mean, obviously <laughs> yeah. in 10 years, you've worked with tons of clients, oh, yeah. right? So find some clients that will come and talk about you. You orchestrate and ask those questions. So this is what Marty did. And then what he did is started running ads. So he started running ads everywhere. So then the audience and doing a lot of retargeting for these. So anybody that went on the site oh, once, man, you stalked yep. the hell out of them. So he went into <laughs> a meeting with a major airline and he was telling me, he was like, I went in and they weren't really asking any questions. I was just pitching the whole time. And he's like, there's no way I want it. They said, when can you start? He was kind of blown away. He didn't want to say in the meeting, like, why? Like, really? A couple wow. months later, once he had the relationship, he's like, why'd you pick us? Like, you guys barely ask any questions. And he goes, I saw your content everywhere of all the successes. Yeah. That would be one strategy I, I would tell everybody to do. And then also the other one would be, if you know you want to go after Verizon or whoever, right? Seeing who your network 
is connected to the person you want to go after or start literally sending them stuff and reaching out and being helpful. I just put out a video. If you're going after a consumer brand, I was like, let's say you bought this little car, right? On my desk and be nice like, car. oh, Tonka. Let's say this is, you're about my age, like Tonka toys, right? Like the little oh, yeah. construction car, right? Be like, yep. hey, Tonka, I just bought your Tonka Shelby GT500. Really love it. There's a couple of things I would tell you about the experience that I went through. I had a couple ideas for you. I'm a marketing agency. If you have five minutes, I'd love to get on a call with you. First off, you bought their product. So you're a customer. Yep with valuable feedback that they want to know. So it's just a couple different things that would work outside of I referrals, but referrals are great too. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. It's like the one thing we've been leaning into a lot in the last six months that's kind of blown up for us and outpaced outbound for us, it has been partnerships with other agencies. Like the majority of our new business recently has come from branding and marketing agencies where we've been able to partner up and be like, all right, you guys, you guys finish the strategy. Once you need it built and executed, That's we're the there point. to deliver that. And then when it needs to be kind of promoted and launched, you guys step back in. And that's been, that's been interesting. I think we're actually, that's our next outbound campaign is really focusing on how to tap into that world and find more of the kind of creative type agencies to partner with. Like we've got engineering forever and we've got great UX experience, but the design and marketing yeah. and promotion stuff like that is not our world. Yeah. I, I look at the multi-channel approach is inbound, outbound strategic partnerships. Cause like, yep. you know, one of the ways that we grew solar velocity was through, you know, when Microsoft was coming up and Sitefinity and a lot of these tools, like when SharePoint, like we developed our own content management system back in like 99 <laughs> to 2001. Oh my God. And then we were like, yep. I was like most agency owners. I was like, I kept saying yes to our clients, but no to our agency and all the stuff that we were building. So it distracted us. And then we were like, let's just partner with these people. And then looking back, I was like, well, crap, man. Like my friend David created Pardot and sold for a hundred million dollars oh, in cool. cash. And I was like, damn it. I was like, <laughs> like, so. We were so close to that. Yeah. I was so close. That's crazy. <laughs> but. Well, this has been amazing, Graham. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit agencies listening in about, you know, how they can achieve some of the growth and or learn from the mistakes that you uh, you guys made? Yeah, I think one one thing I would highlight is a few years ago we were cemented in the belief that complex creative problems in software development had to be solved by people in the same room. In the last three years, we've transitioned from a large headquarters office to a fully remote, fully distributed organization. And every meaningful metric we track from efficiency to speed to delivery to cadence, call it employee retention. And so I would say anyone, anyone struggling with, can I, can I build a remote distributed company? Our experience has absolutely. And the access to talent it gives you i mean that's why we've been growing is the people we have and the people we can attract so yeah. if you're if you're stuck in the mindset that that is that is challenging or not possible for certain problems i would i would definitely push back on that and oh, yeah. three years ago we were in the camp of like not possible can't be done no way and uh we have since been enlightened and are now preaching <laughs> well yeah i mean uh, we had lots of mastermind members that struggle with that and i was like Look, you can attract talent anywhere in the world, anywhere. Yeah. And they'll be actually more efficient because they're not like our offices were in Atlanta, Georgia. And so there was horrible traffic, it's, you know, not as bad as LA traffic, but like probably second in the country. Yeah, not great. <laughs> and like I had some developers that would sit in traffic for an hour and a half every day, one way. Yep. So yep, now you crazy. can get three more hours of production some people are less stressed. They're happy. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. You just got to find the right people that you don't have to babysit. The babysit people don't work well at home because they'll be like, let me sit down by the beach and by the pool yeah. or whatever. Like though, I saw like some cool thing. Um, I love Instagram reels. And there was a guy that kind of walked on the beach and people were filming him and he walked to like this big green screen thing. It hooked on the back of his chair. And then yep. he proceeded to do like a, a Zoom call. A Zoom like, call. Well, he went viral on TikTok, right? He did all kinds of ridiculous stuff. Like he did like roller coasters and skiing and all with the like Zoom background and stuff. I should have thought of that. 
Yeah, it was hilarious. But yeah, no, I think a lot of that also comes down to how you measure performance in your organization. And it's uh, to me, it's less about monitoring every minute of somebody's time and more understanding like when you should be shipping milestones and what the overall cadence of your project should be. And as long as people are on track for those metrics and what you're expecting, managing a remote is pretty straightforward. Exactly. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, amazing. What's awesome. the agency website people can go and check you out? Uh, check us out at iversoft.ca or grahambarlow.com if you want to reach out and chat. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. And if you guys enjoyed the episode, make sure you share it out with another fellow agency owner that uh, could benefit from this. Uh, obviously, you're probably not going to share it out with your competition because you don't want to help them out. But I'm sure you have some strategic partners, so make sure you share it out with them. And if you guys want to be a part of an agency owner mastermind where we're talking and really focusing on your biggest challenge and seeing what's working for other agency owners, I'd love to invite all of you to check it out. Make sure you go to agencymastery360.com. And until next time, have a swank day. 